Hey gang, are you a business to business marketer? If so, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long. Your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you're going to have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior-level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You'll also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B, and they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn Ads is also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Folks, for me... LinkedIn is the number one place I go when I want to reach decision makers. You should too. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. On this episode of Winfluence. What you consider community for one title could be completely different for another title. So that's one thing that's definitely hard to assess, but actually a fun challenge, right? To really go and on earth and figure out where those communities are and where we should water, where maybe you should pull back, right? It's tempering how you are communicating, thinking of the consumer journey and how we want to interact with our consumers and also thinking about building infrastructures for the long term, whatever long term means these days, I think is also another challenge, right? But I don't think anybody has the answer. And, you know, having a bit of humility and understanding that and going with the flow, I think that some of the best companies on earth, you know, are just transparent with what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do it. And we all learn from, you know, our successes and really learn from our failures. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls. And in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. We all like killing two birds with one stone, right? Well, metaphorically, of course. I don't actually kill birds. Neither do you, I hope. When you can learn amazing insights from someone who leads influence marketing for a big brand, but that person also happens to be a content creator themselves, well, now we can double our takeaways and smarts without having to go two different directions. Zena Coda has been a content creator and media personality for the better part of the last 15, 20 years. She's been everything from a red carpet host on television to a voiceover artist to a podcast host and even a stand-up comedian. Her background is in the music industry. She's been in a band as well. And like any artist or creator, she has multiple avenues and outlets for that content and creativity. But sometimes we also have to pay the bills if the art doesn't necessarily take off right away. So Zena's built a nice career on the brand side of things, engaging communities, building marketing and influence programs, and more. She recently landed at 2K Games, which is one of the most successful video game companies out there with titles like PGA Tour 2K23, Marvel's Midnight Suns, and the Borderlands series. Xena has the interesting challenge of managing community and influencers for 2K the brand, but also the sub-communities and influence programs for each title because each video game is very different and has a very different audience and thus different influencers. When I realized we had the opportunity to learn two volumes of expertise from one guest, well, I jumped on it. Zena and I caught up recently to dig into her new role at 2K, her approach to influence and influence marketing, and some of the other issues she tackles in the business. But she still has a popular podcast called Everything is Political, so she's still a creator and influencer in her own right. She is also co-founder of the Asian American Collective, which is an organization worth paying attention to. We'll explain why and dive deeper today with Zena on the show. Winfluence is presented by Scipio.ai, the community commerce marketing platform. I love what they're doing so much. I joined the company as executive vice president for marketing in November. Scipio.ai is a platform that has a family of apps that helps you drive commerce through your own community. One of those applications taps into a big theme for 2023 for brands and creators, and that theme is efficiency. Whether you're a brand or creator, you probably spend a lot of time writing and rewriting captions 
for your social media content, you also have to make sure that content will perform well by keeping up with the trends across social media, right? Our gift to you this holiday season, if you will, is a solution called VibeCheck. Think of it as an AI content generator with an extra brain for optimizing social media posts and predicting success. Tell VibeCheck the idea of your post or even campaign. Give it a call to action, the tone of voice you prefer, and the length of your word count. With the push of a button, you have a library of smart content recommendations with predictive analysis of how that post will perform. VibeCheck's powerful generative AI engine digs into the big data of over 140 million social media users, posts, images, and videos. It mines that data for deep learning insights that gives you not just content, but content that will perform. That makes it very different from other AI content generators out there. Now, those of you who know me know I'm not a big fan of automating content creation. Well, first of all, the generative AI behind what we have at Scipio.ai is pretty fantastic. The humanity's there. But that's actually not the point. VibeCheck produces a ton of great content to save you writing time. You still need to review and edit. Make sure it's perfect. But it gets you 90% of the way there, which saves you time and makes you more efficient. Scipio.ai wants to give you that power and efficiency as a holiday gift. Sign up for a two-week free trial, no credit card required. Go to jasonfalls.co slash vibecheck and start creating all the captions and content you need with the click of a button. It's free for two weeks, no credit card required. All you got to do is sign up and check it out. I think you're going to love it. JasonFalls.co slash VibeCheck. Seriously, this is going to change the game. If you write a lot of content, a lot of social media captions, or you spend hours writing social media captions for clients, this is really going to save you some time. JasonFalls.co slash VibeCheck. Managing community and influence for a brand, then for multiple communities under the brand. Hard task that will break down with the woman doing it big. Zena Coda from 2K Games is next on Winfluence. Hey there, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. Real quick, I want to make sure you know that the world's leading B2B marketing expo is returning to the Los Angeles Convention Center on March 21st and 22nd. It's high time we got back together to learn, see the latest technologies and solutions, and network, right? Join thousands of marketing professionals just like you to learn from over 250 industry expert speakers, educational masterclasses, and over 300 exhibitors. And this year, your ticket also gets you into the Sales Innovation Expo and the Marketing and Advertising Expo. So it's like three conferences in one. It's March 21st and 22nd at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Go to b2bmarketingexpo.us to register. That's b2bmarketingexpo.us. The Marketing Podcast Network is a proud partner of the B2B Marketing Expo for 2023. We'll see you in L.A. Zena, I love your title, Head of Global Digital Community Marketing. There's a lot to unpack there. I know the idea of community is, on one hand, more pronounced in gaming than other verticals, perhaps different than, say, clothing or a CPG brand would use it. So I guess a good starter question for us here is, what's your sort of definition of what community means to you and then maybe to 2K as well? Oh, that's a good one. Thanks for having me on, by the way. I would say I actually reshaped the name of the department because when I initially came in, it was head of social influencer and community engagement, which was a mouthful. (laughs) But ultimately I switched it to digital community marketing because it's interesting in this ecosystem, right? Like everything that you're doing that falls underneath each of those individual pillars actually is just community marketing, right? And when you think about the community and the extensions of the community, social is the direct in like the OG community, right? Like other than forums and other, you know, old school quote unquote community, you know, kind of portals, social is really the place that you start to incubate conversations. And, you know, some people see social as an output as a leaderboard, right? Which is just bad practice in the first place. But, you know, in gaming and at for 2K specifically, we see social actually as a place where you start to build community and build a vibe and build a voice for who we are as individual titles and who we are as a brand, right? So, you know, identifying that pretty quickly and seeing that social was a community driver, it made sense to me to kind of reshape that into just overall digital community marketing. And when you talk about the creator and influencer space, I think that sometimes people forget that those are communities, 
<laughs> Those are literally the strongest communities, right? So we have a program called the Next Maker Program, which is almost like a creator loyalty program with some of our most loyal creators that love our games. And, you know, we engage with them directly, give them all kinds of perks and benefits, create, you know, IRL opportunities for them as well to get together, to stream, to talk, to get access to games. And I think that's really important because again, here we are creating more community within our digital space. And then on the other side of the, you know, the fence, you have actual community engagement, quote unquote, right? And in that space, you have avenues like Twitch, right? Because that are driven by content and the way that we're kind of framing it content. And we know that content is a beast, right? Like when you're trying to make it consistently. So that's another area that we've really doubled down on and we're trying to kind of push through even more. And also under that is everything we're doing with Discord, which is the new forum, right? And Discord has endless opportunities for building different communities, whether or not it's more functional and more feedback loops for the games, or it's actually, you know, going in and creating a specific initiative that we want to execute with our community. I think we're only starting to scratch the surface, but we have some pretty deep ones already with NBA, with PGA, we've seen a lot of learnings and it's cool to start to build more of a space for people to not only meet each other, but also have an opportunity to learn more and for us to be a voice back to them too, right? So when we're thinking of how we incubate all of these things and in the gaming industry in general, like you live and die by it because gaming is really the only entertainment method where you can have an opinion and your opinion gets heard and actually is reflected in the game, right? Like, You can make a crappy album and everybody's like, next time (laughs) you can make a crappy movie and you take the L and then you move on and try to make a better one next time. Right. And you might get some feedback, but there is a big lapse time between in gaming. It's more immediate. Right. So the precedence on community is paramount in this type of situation. And for us, it's just really been great to kind of see that as it's matured into one coalesced function over the last few months of me being here and seeing where it's going to go is really exciting for the future. Okay. So you made a little bit of a reference to this. So 2K games obviously is the brand, but your products are the games themselves. And I don't think it's hard for people to understand that the influential voices and fans and community of say PGA Tour 2K23 are different from Marvel's Midnight Suns or the Borderlands series. So I'm guessing you're managing multiple instances of communities, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they all have different needs and cadences and wants. And again, like what you consider community for one title could be completely different for another title. So that's one thing that's definitely hard to assess, but actually a fun challenge, right? To really go and unearth and figure out where those communities are and where we should water, where maybe you should pull back, right? It's tempering how you are communicating, thinking of the consumer journey and how we want to interact with our consumers and also thinking about building infrastructures for the long term, whatever long term means these days, I think is also another challenge, right? But I don't think anybody has the answer. And, you know, having a bit of humility and understanding that and going with the flow, I think that some of the best companies on earth, right, you know, are just transparent with what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do it. And we all learn from, you know, our successes and really learn from our failures, right, or where things didn't quite go the way that we expected. But the learning is the key in building community, because if you just hang out and no one's coming, well... (laughs) got to move on to somewhere else, right? Like you're going to have to make sure that you're showing up where that audience is and showing up meaningfully. Right. I'm just kind of trying to get my head wrapped around the whole sort of community engagement and management piece for so many different, you know, basically brands. What's the size and scope of that look like? What kind of team do you have to manage all that? I have a pretty big team. Again, I think a lot of automation and just like streamlining processes and like leveraging where you can eliminate things from the past, right? That don't necessarily matter as much today. I like to be very forward thinking and think to the future, right? Especially because I am starting in a new capacity in a new place, bringing a new function to life. Just really important to kind of think forward that way. Team's pretty big, pretty deep. Each of these teams really like is focused on their specific areas and also bringing it together in a digital community marketing lens, right? So when we're thinking about marketing something from a community aspect, like we're thinking of creators, right? Because creators are the people who are within those communities. We're also working with those creators on creating content, right? There's a whole ecosystem that's there. And how does that show up through social? So when you think about that and the different ways that each of those different functions coordinate and also complement each other, that's where like we try to create more efficiencies and better ways for the teams to be working together and considering each other because 
that creativity, that synergy actually is like a game changer for any organization, whether it's us or, you know, another company and it doesn't matter the industry, right? When you're actually understanding how those different touch points create a consumer journey, you're able to really understand like how you can best impact your consumers. And also, hey, you may be missing them in one area, but you might be hitting them in another. So on this show, we talk a lot about influence marketing without the R. And what that implies, at least to me, is there's more to it than social media influencers. When you're building out influencer concepts or when you're thinking about building out influencer concepts in this new role, are you thinking that you're going to look externally to gamers who have established channels on Twitch and YouTube and other platforms? Or are you more apt to kind of look internally at the current community that's already there and try to find those brand enthusiasts? Is there a preference on your side or is there a difference in how you would look at it from an entertainment product that has an engaged community versus maybe a consumer product that doesn't? I think consumer products do have advocates, right? Like think about it, McDonald's is crushing it. <laughs> and people are have affinity towards brands in a completely different way than I think they've even had in the past, right? Like, like brands have become identity in some ways, right? It really is kind of a reflection of what your values are, especially with the younger generations, right? I would say it's, it's a balance of both, to be honest, because you obviously want to like water those relationships that got you where you are today. But then it's also taking a look at like, how do you expand that audience? Are there audiences that you may have lost along the way, but could redeem? Are there also like audiences that you are not hitting, like, you know, you probably see it nausea on people like, how do you target Gen Z and Gen Alpha? And like, what is the best way? And it's authenticity and it's TikTok and it's this and it's that. Yeah, it's all of those things. And it's honestly community, right? Like, because those younger generations grew up living on digital communities. So it's the number one way that they know how to communicate. And I think once you like grapple with that as an elder millennial myself, like, and just understand that communication flow and understand like the precedence that your marketing campaigns need to lean into for reaching those communities, then I think like it makes it easier to see what that split looks like, right? I don't think it does anybody well to abandon your old consumers, right? Like your consumers are there for a reason, especially in the gaming space. I feel like they might've grown up, but they say, Hey, they also had kids that will now be playing your game too. You know, I'm an elder millennial, as I mentioned, and I have friends that are my age that also have kids that are now like getting super into NBA. Right. So understanding hitting all those different generational touch points, I think too, is tough, right? Because those are multiple different communities. But when you have a map against what you're trying to do, I think that makes it as succinct and as calculated as possible while leaving room for like kind of just growing the community and the way that the community grows, right? Like you never know what's going to happen, right? Like you put your best effort forward and see what happens. And sometimes you're pleasantly surprised, to be honest, in the way that things kind of come back. Well, I'm delightfully uncomfortable with the term elder millennial. Throw that out there now. I think it's high time for me to just start screaming, get off my lawn and let y'all take over <laughs> And anyway, somebody asked me the other day what generation I am, and I said almost dead. So that's where I am. But we are talking to the fantastic Zing Dakota. She is the head of digital community marketing globally for 2K Games, makers of fine video games. But Zing is also a creator, a media personality, an influencer, her own self. When we come back, we're going to talk about that side of her world. Stay tuned. Hey there, it's Jason Falls. If your company or maybe one of your clients sells to marketers, you look for advertising channels that guarantee business marketers are paying attention, right? Let me introduce you to the Marketing Podcast Network. You're listening to it right now. It's a network of podcasts all about marketing. So 100% of MPN's audience are marketers. Reach them by advertising on the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more and find our media kit at marketingpodcasts.net. Back with Zena Dakota from 2K Games, learning a lot about her leadership and approach to community there. But I do want to turn the conversation a little different direction now because, Zena, you are a fairly prolific media personality, podcaster, influencer, creator. How do you describe yourself outside of your professional role? Mm, <laughs> creatively curious at all times. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I started as a media personality at a time where it was an actual profession, <laughs> where we would go in studio and like read from a teleprompter, you know, and it feels so foreign now considering the ways that people consume and just almost kind of ridiculous. And, you know, I'd make my $500 for the day and was balling, <laughs> you know, in the early 2000s, this legendary time. But think about it, that was 20 years ago, right? It's insane to think 
the different trajectories they've taken within such a short amount of time where you had to earn your right and your spot in the journalism world and the media world and be a voice, be confident and get out there and make those relationships and do the work at the same time. But then also like still make money and live. And I lived in New York City. So, you know, we were eating pizza every day. So it definitely is kind of inspiring and wild to see like how people are just really generating income and becoming their own businesses without having to go through all those barriers and those pain in the ass things that I had to do early on in my career. You know, would I take it back? Hell no. I loved being part of that generation of, you know, just media personalities and journalists and people who were given a platform and a voice, but you had to really fight for it at that time, you know? So it's been fun to kind of pivot that on a personal level too, and find where my creativity is kind of satiated through those new mediums. Yeah, it's really interesting to think that the younger generations will never know what it's like to audition for, to be on television because all you got to do is turn on your damn phone and live stream from wherever you are and you're on television. So, Well, you think about it. That's why it's kind of interesting because I worked in music for a very long time, right? And in some ways, you know, we do a lot on at 2K in the music space too. And I run a nonprofit that's music that actually originated from the music space too. So I'm never far from my heart. I'm a musician, I'm an artist, and it's been cool to kind of like see how it's broken down a lot of barriers for people that had been previously gatekept in a way that was probably not the most effective, but also at the same rate, there's a bit of a QC aspect here too, right? There's quality control. Are these people really performers, right? They have a hit song that like pops off on TikTok, but can they perform? Can they tour? Can they actually go do the media thing? You know, can they get up and do those things? And I think it's very similar with media personalities that pop off on TikTok or whatever. Like, sure, there's some that, elevate to that next level, maybe get into YouTube, Hollywood or whatever. But then there's plenty more who just could never hack that part of life, right? So it's two different performance mechanisms or two different like avenues, right, that you can take that I still feel is there, but in a completely different way. So I know you've done hosting and emceeing for TV. You've done commercial work over the years. I think you've also worn the label of stand-up comedian, but you've also juggled all that with real jobs, as it were. Is there a world where you forego companies and brands and just be a creator yourself, or do you like playing both sides of the fence? I'm not retired yet, so maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I would say, yeah, I mean, that's always in theory been a dream of mine, right? To like just focus completely on those aspects. And it's not just monetary resources that kind of drive me. There's something really awesome about being a businesswoman because it really sharpens my entrepreneurial skills, right? Like I remember when I was in a DJ on Sirius, when I was hosting a morning show every day and then going to work at a creative agency all day long. (laughs) I was working on music projects and was also like a music outlet. So they were all interconnected, but I never felt like I was working in some ways because it was like, I was just going from like one really dope creative idea to the next. And then I would go to practice with my band at night. And I felt like all of these things were intrinsically connected. Right. So when I think about like business and why I do what I do, like there is so much creativity in what I do every day. Like I'm a problem solver by nature. So like when you couple creativity and problem solving, it's like if I was just solving my own problems all day long, like I could see that being a little overbearing, but it's cool to solve other people's problems (laughs) and the problems that come up that you would never experience in any other form, right? So yeah, there might be a future at some point. I love the idea of being entrepreneurial and autonomous and not relying on anybody else, right? And I think like, hey, creator economy is like powerful enough at this point where you can make that happen if you dedicate. But I'm also not delusional enough to think that like that doesn't come at a price, right? Like you're juggling multiple jobs. You're juggling if you're doing freelance work, clients, especially freelance clients do not always pay on time. Like I know that because I've done tons of freelance work and had an LLC of my own, right? So yeah, that would be the ultimate goal at some point in my life. But I enjoy working with these companies. I enjoy jumping industries in my later 30s. At one point, you couldn't have paid me to leave music, right? There would be no way I would do that. But I felt I reached a point in music where I just was like not working with the smartest people I've ever met. And that was a really odd realization because music people hustle so hard. They can make anything happen overnight. It's very unstrategic nothing is strategic there. And there's no like block by block, like problem solving. So kind of like pivoting into the brand space was at the North face and now coming to 2K, there's a little bit more of ownership and substantiation of like what you're doing and why, and really thinking through that level setting, getting to know the numbers, right. In a way that you just were not seeing your music because you just had to get it done at that moment. And if it didn't get done, it wasn't getting done. 
and then the album fails and you have the moment, right? <laughs> nice. It's interesting to hear that perspective on the music industry. It doesn't surprise me, but I don't think I've ever had anybody sort of assert it that way, but interesting to think about. So I think these days your main content focus away from, you know, the day job is your very interesting and well done podcast. You host Everything's Political. I don't want people to assume what that is, though. So tell us about the show. You know, what launched it? Why is it there? Who's it for? This is probably my fourth podcast that I've done. And then I produced some for like different media outlets back in the day. I have spent a big chunk of my career, like six to seven years being a metal journalist and hosting music content and kind of really deep in that space. And one thing that I always felt that I wasn't able to kind of explore is a little bit of my radicalized side, right? That's a little bit more politically savvy. My mother worked for the United Nations her whole career. So I spent a lot of my childhood kind of deeply entrenched in world politics and really understand the ways of the world and how almost literally everything that you work on in life is political, right? So that had been a concept that had been kind of brewing in my head for some time. I did some women-centric podcasts and it was all leading here because I wanted an opportunity to not only evangelize is like the importance of your vote, the importance of your civic involvement in order for you as an individual in society to actually make your mark, right? Whether or not you believe in one side or the other didn't really matter to me. It was more of empowering people to understand kind of the ways that things are actually working right now, right? And just the political nature of life. So aside from like actual like, you know, city or county politics, state politics, like national politics, right? Right. How can you kind of view everything that you're doing in life, whether it's your job, whether or not it's your family, whether or not also it's just dynamics between friends and other people, right? Everything is political. So it's kind of been fun to build the messaging around what that is, right? Because I've really interviewed a variety of people, you know, for people running for office, which to me is extremely fascinating because it seems masochistic. At times. <laughs> but these are honestly, everybody I've interviewed who's been like candidate. I had a candidate for Manhattan DA, right? Which is a freaking crazy job, right? To think, when you think about it, the national reach of a city job there is wild. I interviewed somebody running for California State Assembly, right? Like these people who are doing the work and where they came from and why they chose to do that work, I think these are the real unsung heroes in the world, right? And a lot of us bitch about politics, but ultimately, like, it's extremely important for us to understand, like, how one domino kind of, like, falls on the other, right? And what our involvement can be. So that's been really fun to do. And, you know, some of the other people I've interviewed are also musicians or artists or other media personalities or people who have been through the ranks of trying to do something with their career and either been stifled or stunted and have dealt with adversity. Because, look, you asked me the question, right? Being in media full-time is brutal. I had a really tough time, you know, auditioning, kind of going through everything, being told I wasn't white enough, being told I wasn't skinny enough, especially like during that time, Thick was not in. <laughs> Thick was not in. I lost a lot of weight. You will never see me that skinny again. But there is an acceptance now of all types of body types, personalities, faces, skin tones, looks, and identities that was not there when I was really deep in the trenches there 15 years ago. So, you know, being able to kind of tell those stories and it also like give people the tools and context to hear, you know, those kind of tales <laughs> is really important because I think that people can learn from those kind of instances. So like when I say everything's political, genuinely everything in life is political and life's nature is political. So I hope that people take that away from the podcast and understand that they're going to learn a little bit of something if they're tuning in and listening. Well, and for those of you who are tuning in listening, you can search for Everything's Political or where you get your podcasts. We'll also make sure there are links in the show notes as well. Zena, I would be remiss if I didn't also ask you about something that I think extends that conversation a little bit more, and that's the Asian American Collective. I know it's a big deal in what you do. Tell us about it and then maybe tell us how brands and creators might benefit from getting involved. Oh, absolutely. So in 2020, I was working at Atlantic Records, heading up urban digital marketing. My team consisted of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, right? But one thing I noticed was like, there were a few really like engaged and hardworking Asians like myself, I'm Filipino, you know, that were working within our company. And I just 
thought really deeply. I'm like, there really has not been a place for us to kind of coalesce as a group. And I was working very closely with a lot of black women who had great networks between HBCUs and just like other sororities or just kind of relationships they had built over the years and seeing that camaraderie, you know, I was like, where's that for us? Like, I want that for us too. And I want to build that same kind of amazing community because the work that they were doing and championing each other's careers and just kind of being a network for each other was just enviable. It was amazing, right? To kind of see that level of support. So for Asian American Collective, I had this idea in my head forever and knew that I couldn't do it alone, right? <laughs> because it just really takes an army to, to run a nonprofit or even a run a community organization. I met my partners through working in music. One works at YouTube Music as a head of East Coast Relations. Her name's Grace Lee. And the other one is a huge agent at WME who's been working in hip hop for years, right? So we know each other, worked with each other in some kind of capacity, kind of got together, had breakfast one day with Grace when I was living in New York. And we're like, let's just do this. Let's just see what it becomes, right? And our first event we did at the Grammys in 2020 at CAA when my partner Caroline was actually working there. And we had hundreds of people show up. And we were like, holy crap, we actually have something here, right? And then of course, we know what happened in March of 2020. <laughs> the entire world shut down. We had one other thing in New York too, in between, which was also extremely successful. And then I actually decided to move to Denver to take on a role at the North Face. So I unfortunately left, but then the pandemic hit. So it worked out in my favor. And we kept the community going because during that time, people really wanted to find something, find community and find a voice and find different ways that they can kind of communicate with each other. So we grew digitally and then and when everything started happening with Stop Asian Hate, we had already been doing a mentorship program and have kind of had kind of dug into that part of what we were trying to achieve. And we started to really like become advocates for the community too during that time. Like we weren't a nonprofit yet. We started a petition with change.org that got a lot of visibility with celebrities because we had all those connections. And, you know, people were just so supportive of what we were trying to do and build visibility with mainstream media, you know, for kind of these hate crimes that were happening to Asian Americans at the time. And continue to happen, right? Like this, but it was the first time that we felt compelled and I felt empowered even as an Asian American to have that voice and stand by that voice, right? So we were one of the you know main drivers of that. And after that, it just all kind of exploded, right? We continued on our course of really looking at education, advocacy for the community, and being an in real life resource, right? We started to trickle back into it. I like to think we're kind of post-COVID now, fingers crossed, and really have been doing community events and supporting through nonprofit. We became an official nonprofit, you know, supporting other nonprofits and all of the volunteer days that they do. But our mentorship program is a big driver partnering with other organizations to provide mentorship opportunities, creating community as well. We have a Slack channel. We do in real life events in New York and LA, looking to expand in the next year. It's literally been one of the most satisfying things in my life. And like, I've done a lot of things, but watching and seeing the progression that so many people have made from their careers, just being part of our community and meeting each other, which was literally the whole thing that we wanted to do has been so cool to see and to see celebrity engagement, honestly, with what we're doing as well and gaining a little bit more notoriety from Hollywood. You know, there's other groups like Gold House that are also doing similar things that we're friends with. And it's just a really cool community of like Asians doing different things and catering to different communities, helping to uplift each other and be a support network. That's fantastic. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us and certainly appreciate your thoughts on things community, influencer, and otherwise with us all here on Influence. Where can people find you and your various things on the web? Oh my God. I'm so easy to find. It's just at Zena Coda everywhere. Two E's, Z-E-N-A. Not Zena like the Warrior Princess. <laughs> Hate that. <laughs> and that is a millennial callback because nobody younger is like would have a clue who Xena the Warrior Princess is. Oh man, I miss Xena Warrior Princess. <laughs> yeah. I was a Gabrielle fan though. I don't know. I like her. Uh, so I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, just Xena Coda everywhere. It's pretty easy to find me, luckily. That's great. Well, thank you for being here. This was fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Fascinating stuff from Zena. I loved the learning she delivered for us. I know you'll take that and apply it to your business too. Find more about Zena and her links in our show notes page at jasonfalls.co slash Zenacoda. If you want to know how to spell that, it's Z-E-N-A-K-O-D-A. Z-N-A-K-O-D-A. So jasonfalls.co slash Zenacoda. Also, don't forget to completely change the way you produce social media content for the better. Get Vibe Check from Scipio.ai, a two-week free trial, no credit card required, awaits you at jasonfalls.co slash vibecheck. 
and help us create a better vibe for the show here on Winfluence. Tell someone who might want to know more about influence marketing about this podcast. Send them to winfluencepod.com or share a link to this episode on your social network of choice. If you have a moment, drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We're on all of them. You can also help make a future episode of Winfluence awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send an email to jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous, record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show using the recording. Winfluence is a production of Falls and Partners and presented by Scipio.ai. The technical production is by MPN Studios. Winfluence airs along MPN, the marketing podcast network. Thanks for listening, folks. Let's talk again soon on Winfluence. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. And if you need help with your influence marketing strategy, drop me a line at jason at jasonfalls.com. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Christopher Hines hosts a great podcast called Founder Success Methods. Chris, tell us what these fine folks will get out of listening. You'll learn how to really grow your startup and get the basic strategies to build a successful company. We show you all the details and all the strategies that you just can't find on Google, YouTube, or even other podcasts. Ooh, we're going to be lined up for this one. Where can people subscribe? You can search for the podcast, Founder Success Methods, wherever you listen to podcasts, or find me on Twitter at Chris Podcasting. Or go to marketingpodcasts.net. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.